Okay, so I know we tried this. So I'm assuming it still works. Uh, but you know, but uh, if if you stop seeing the slides or if you stop hearing me at some point, just just give me a shout, and I will try and keep an eye on the chat. Um, but I I only have about 14 slides. One of these days, I'm I'm going to give a one hour presentation with only one slide. But I'm still working my way up to that. Um, but I'm gonna but I'm gonna try and leave lots of time for questions. Um, so go ahead and put them in the chat if you like. Um, and if you, you know, if, if, if you stop hearing me or, or seeing anything, just, just give me a shout. Um, and if I don't see something in the chat, then we'll get to it at the end for sure. So, no, I'll, watch, I'll watch it for you too. All right. Thanks, Andy. Um, all right. So, um, big questions in lunar science, which is, which is a very broad topic. So just to, before we dive into to lunar science, just to, give you um, a, a quick introduction, though Andy introduced me very well. Uh, so my name is Parvati Prem. I am a planetary scientist at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, or APL for short. Um, I've been here since 2017, after I got my PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so, so I have a foot in many of the places uh, that that you're from. And, and my, my husband was in New York for a few years. So we have a little bit of a connection there as well. Um, but yeah, but I, um, I, I grew up mostly in India, partly in England. Um, I did undergrad in aerospace engineering in Singapore. Um, I had a scholarship to, to study at a university there. Then I came to Texas in 2010 for my PhD. Um, and I've been in the US ever since. Um, and I, APL is, is my home institution. Um, I'm also a member of a couple of, um, of survey teams. And by now, um, if, if you haven't already, you will. You'll hear a survey mentioned a lot. It's the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, uh, which consists of, of several teams, one at LPI and others um, all over the, the country. I'm a member of two of those teams, which are sort of headquartered at um, NASA Goddard in Maryland. And the other one is sort of split between WashU and St. Louis and the University of Hawaii. Um, but the members are all over the place. I'm also a science team member on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission. So LRO um, is, is another mission that you will become very familiar with should you choose to focus your research on the moon. Um, I work with the, the infrared and the radar instruments on LRO, which has been uh, orbiting the moon for, for more than 10 years now and is, is still going strong. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about me and I'll sort of mention a little bit more about um, the, the science that I do uh, where, you know, as we at appropriate points uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, but I'd spent most of my academic career uh, studying the moon. You know, when I started, I, I didn't think that how many years of it, that, that 10, 11 years later, I would still be studying the moon, but it's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful world and it's, it's hard to look away from uh, once, once you start getting to know it better. Uh, this is one of my favorite lunar photos in the background. This one was taken by um, Apollo 14 as it was on its way back home um, from, from its visit to, to our nearest neighbor. So just to start with a little bit of an introduction and overview of, of this presentation. So my main goals um, for today, based on my conversation with Andy, are to introduce you all to some medium level open questions in lunar science. And so what I mean by that is that these are questions that are broader than the research questions you'll end up focusing on in detail. Um, but they're also not super high level. So this is sort of um, somewhere in between why is the moon and the detailed questions that you're going to get into um, in your research. So these are medium level questions that I wanted to introduce you all to. Um, and so my goal for today is to introduce you to some of those questions. Um, and especially I know some of you might be what might end up watching this uh, later in the future. Um, and so whenever and wherever you're listening to this, um, I do also want uh, to set a goal for, for all of you to um, uh, 
to, to ask lots of questions. So I think questions, questions are a way to help each other out. I mean, if you have a question, it's very likely someone else has the same question, or maybe you've thought of a question that no one else has. And if you ask it, then, then we'll all learn something in the process. Um, and you know, asking questions is, is a muscle that, that you exercise. And so, um, and science involves using that muscle a lot. And so this is a good opportunity to, to exercise your question asking muscles. Um, in terms of content, so I, um, I want to give you a brief introduction to the moon and to ways of doing lunar science. And of course, this is something um, you'll, you'll become more familiar with different aspects of this as, as you get into your readings and deeper into your research. Um, and as far as this presentation goes, in terms of how I've, I've organized it, I've relied on the questions and concepts that were framed um, in a report called Advancing Science of the Moon that was written in 2017. So the, the planetary science community, in fact, in fact, I think many scientific communities um, often write uh, these, these sort of sweeping reports. And so the story behind this report is that in 2007, um, a, uh, a large group of lunar scientists came together to write a document called the scientific context for the exploration of the moon. So this is in 2007, all of these scientists came together talked to each other for a few days and came out with this report in which they identified some of the big science questions that we wanted to find out about the moon. In 2017, um, a similar group, including some of the same people, some, some new people. Um, so 10 years later, um, another group came together and wrote this report called Advancing Science of the Moon. And so what they did was to look back at the report they wrote 10 years ago and think about well, have we answered all of those questions? Um, and if not, you know, what new questions do we have? And, and what old questions have changed and become more important? And what have we answered? What do we still not know? So that's the, the story behind these reports. And there's a link here. Um, it's, it's, it's fairly readable. So, um, so I've included a link here in case that's something you want to click through to at some point. Um, just, just as a preliminary, th there are very likely going to be words or concepts in here um, that you're not familiar with yet. That's okay. Um, make a note of those and, and we can talk more about them at, at the end. Um, you know, when I started grad school, I, um, I, I you know, I, 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 could, I couldn't name the, the planets in order. So, um, so you know, so, so it, there's nothing wrong if, if, you know, there's a word or concept here that, that you haven't um, heard before. Totally fine. And, and we'll get to all of those. So with that, I, before we dive into questions, so I wanted to start with a, a really big picture view of, of the moon. And the, the, the first report, the one that was written in 2007, opens with, with this quote that I, I, I copied verbatim because I think it expresses why the moon is so interesting very well. So this report says, uh, opens with, with the words that above all, the moon is a witness to four and a half billion years of solar system history. And there is really nowhere else in the entire solar system where we can see back with so much clarity to the time when Earth and the other terrestrial planets were formed and life emerged on Earth. So we live in the Earth-Moon system. There are two neighbors in, in the system. Um, and this is sort of the, the, the broad contours of the moon story as we understand it today. So our current uh, best theory is that the moon formed around four and a half billion years ago when um, solar system worlds were still colliding with each other all the time. And um, the early earth collided with, with another body that threw out a cloud of debris that later became the moon. So the moon formed about four and a half billion years ago. Um, over the next many, many billions of years. And in fact, this is a process that in some senses hasn't really ended. Um, but over the next many billions of years, the lunar surface was bombarded by comets and asteroids, all of the leftover building blocks of solar system formation. Um, some were icy, some were rocky. They left craters on the lunar surface. Some of them brought water and other material to the moon and also to the early Earth. And so this is the time when the moon is being bombarded, the earth is being bombarded, and on earth, the oceans are starting to form, life is starting to find a foothold. While all of that is going on, 
the impact's quietened down um, a little bit over time, uh, but something dramatic starts to happen on the lunar surface. The moon starts to undergo an era of volcanic eruptions, which lasts from about 3.8 billion years ago to around 1 billion years ago. So for billions of years in the distant past, remember this is even before, way, way before we get to the dinosaurs even, but the, um, the lunar surface is, is all aglow with these lavas that are erupting uh, from the interior. And they've left their mark on the moon even today. Um, so when you look up at the moon in the night sky, all of those dark patches that you see are the, um, the, the basalts, the hardened um, volcanic rock that was, uh, that was formed during those volcanic eruptions. And then even today, in the present day, when you look up the moon, it might seem like a quiet world, but it's, it's, it is in fact still an active one in many ways. So the surface of the moon continues to be exposed to the solar wind. So the solar wind is the stream of hydrogen and other ions, mostly hydrogen, charged particles that flow out from the sun and touch everything in the solar system. The moon is sitting right in that flow of charged hydrogen. And as we'll see later, that affects um, the surface and, and, the, and, and changes the surface in, in, in some pretty magical ways. And of course, the impacts never really ended, even though the era of these large basin forming impacts is, is largely uh, behind us. Even today, the moon continues to be bombarded, um, pelted by, by micrometeoroids, so things ranging from around the size of a fist to the size of a grain of sand. And so even today, the moon is very much um, an, an active world. So, so that's the moon. That's sort of the, the, the broad contours of, of the story. How do we know this story? Uh, in the next couple of slides, I wanted to talk a little bit about the different ways in which we've pieced together and uh, pieces of, of that story. One is through remote sensing. Um, and there's, there's a lot of information on, on the slide and some of the other slides. And so don't worry about you know, writing everything down. I'm, I'm, I, I will make sure that um, you have access to the slides later. So remote sensing. Uh, remote sensing is kind of what it sounds like. It's a way to, to get to know worlds uh, remotely um, using telescopes or cameras and telescopes on spacecraft or, or even, uh, even on Earth or in, in Earth orbit. And so the Really, the, the, the one core thing, um, perhaps, to understand about remote sensing um, is that it involves the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with the, um, the, with the surface of, of the moon and, and, and of other worlds. And the one core thing to, to realize is that electromagnetic radiation, as, as, um, as you might be familiar with, comes in a, a whole spectrum of wavelengths. Our eyes are sensitive to um, the, the very narrow visible range of the spectrum, but it extends far beyond that in, in terms of wavelength and frequency, uh, which correspond to, to different energies. Um, and those correspond to different spatial scales. So for instance, radio waves are, are, are the size of mountains as they you know, travel, um, travel across the world and travel out into space. Um, whereas other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum are, are sensitive to, to shorter scales. And so the, the core principle behind remote sensing is really that electromagnetic radiation tends to respond to structure that's on the same scale as its wavelength. So often um, if radar waves, um, so for instance, Let's say, let's say you have a, a radio wave, which is usually very long wavelength. Now, if there's a, if, if someone's transmitting, you know, NPR or uh, Bob FM or, you know, whatever it is you, you listen to. Now, a radio wave doesn't really see something the size of a house fly, but it is going to respond and interact with something the size of, of a mountain. And so, and, and you know, the, the significance of this will become more and more clear as you get deeper into this, but something to keep in the back of your mind is that the reason remote sensing um, involves so many different wavelengths and the reason we look at the moon and the other planets and the solar system in so many different wavelengths is because each of those wavelengths is responding to a, a different aspect 
um, and usually a different scale um, of, of the, the structure of, of the planet. And so over the years, the moon has been observed at a whole range of, of wavelengths. Um, and I've included a link here to, uh, to, to a web portal um, that, that many of us use to, to visualize um, some of these data sets. And that's, that's worth checking out. And I'm sure you will at, at some point um, if, if you move forward with your, with your lunar research. Um, now, electromagnetic radiation is not the only way of um, understanding the solar system from a distance. There, there are other ways to do this. There are some techniques that are sensitive uh, that don't involve radiation interacting with surfaces. Some techniques involve measuring forces. So for instance, uh, some spacecraft might carry scientific instruments that measure gravitational or magnetic fields, which give us different kinds of information um, about a planet or a moon. Uh, some, uh, some techniques are sensitive to, to particles. So for instance, uh, there are dust detectors and mass spectrometers, which are basically molecule detectors or ion detectors that are sensitive to charged or neutral molecules. Um, so remote sensing, most, most of the, the data sets that you'll end up working with either involve electromagnetic radiation interacting with surfaces, they may involve forces, or they may involve uh, measuring particles, molecules, ions, in some cases, dust particles. And so I, I wanted to, to provide you with, with sort of framework for, for the data sets that many of you will end up working with. Some questions to ask when you're working with remote sensing data. Um, the first thing to ask is, is, what is it really that the instrument is, is measuring? Um, and this is an active or a passive technique. So for instance, you might be working with, with a, a data set um, where you're, you're looking at a map and what that map is showing you might be reflected sunlight from the lunar surface. Um, so in that case, the instrument's measuring reflected sunlight. Um, that particular example is a passive technique. So active remote sensing is when you carry your source of electromagnetic radiation. So for instance, this might be something um, like uh, a radar, which involve, which sends radio waves towards the moon and then looks at those radio waves as they bounce back. So that's an active technique. Or if you have a laser, you're bringing your own laser with you and shining it down at the moon, looking at what comes back. Those are active techniques. Passive techniques rely on a source of radiation that's already there. Um, throughout most of our solar system, that's the sun. So when you're looking at reflected radiation from the sun, that's a passive technique because you're not bringing your own sunshine, you're just measuring the sunshine that's already there. Then what's the resolution of the data? Um, when you look at a map, what is the, the spatial scale? What's the size of, of the pixels? Um, does it have temporal resolution? Is it time varying data? Um, and then we'll talk about spectra. And when you're dealing with spectra, uh, something else you need to keep in mind is the spectral resolution. And if that makes no sense at all, um, don't worry, we'll, we'll get to spectra when we get to spectra. The, the other thing to keep in mind is what depth the measurement technique is sensitive to. There are some data sets that can only see the surface. Um, there are some data sets that can see below the surface. So for instance, if you have a, a painted wall in front of you right now, um, there, there are, uh, and pretend you're a spacecraft carrying some instruments. Um, so when you look at your wall through one kind of instrument, all you see is the paint, all you see is the surface. But um, you might be carrying some other kind of telescope or camera. And when you look at the wall, you can see right through the paint and you can see the bricks or the, the drywall or whatever that wall is made out of. So depth is, is another. And, and you know, of course, just like walls, planets also have depth um, and, and structure in the subsurface that some techniques might be sensitive to. It's a little bit of a long uh, remote sensing 101, but hopefully it serves you well in the future. But spacecraft and telescopes and cameras aren't the only way to get to know the solar system. Um, many scientists, and, and there, there are many, many different ways to be a planetary or a lunar scientist. Um, and you know, so, so some people work with spacecraft data sets. Some people spend a lot of time in, their, in, in labs. Um, some people like to go out in the field and, and study geology on Earth and use it to understand geology on other planets. Some people like me spend most of their time at computers using um, computer modeling to, to try and understand the moon and, and other worlds. Um, all of those are very complementary and interrelated ways to understand the planets. Some people do more than one of those things. Some people focus on one. Uh, so lots of different ways to be a planetary scientist. Um, 
And other than remote sensing, some of the um, other approaches to, to getting to know the moon to be aware of are, well, there's data analysis, which we talked about a little bit. Um, some people spend a great deal of their time doing lab experiments of various kinds. Also analyzing samples. So when we talk about samples in planetary science, we're usually talking about um, rocks and dust that have been brought back from the lunar surface uh, by, by, the, uh, by the astronauts or sometimes by robotic spacecraft. Um, we also have meteorites from asteroids and also we have lunar meteorites and Martian meteorites from the moon and Mars. Um, and and those, those are sort of samples that make their way across to us at, in, on Earth without any, uh, any robotic intervention required. Um, and so analyzing those samples um, can, can, can tell you a lot. And so these are just two photos from uh, of some of my colleagues at, at APL. Um, this is Dr. Nancy Chabot, Colin Hamill, um, who's, who was an undergraduate student when this photo was taken. He's doing his PhD now. I think he's at Purdue. Um, they're in the meteorite lab at APL. So um, you can see Nancy holding a couple of meteorites. Um, and then on the computer here is, is a view um, of uh, a meteorite viewed under one of their instruments. And I'm not quite sure what the colors mean, but I'm guessing they show different minerals, different rock types that make up that meteorite. Uh, this is Angela Stickle, Dr. Angela Stickle and Dr. Terry Daly in the Planetary Impact Lab, um, where they, um, they basically have a gun that they use to, um, to, to fire a, a, a miniature asteroid into a test bed. Um, and then, you know, it usually throws out a, a bunch of gravel and rock or sand, whatever they're using. And, and here they are measuring that and having a good time. So sample analysis lab experiments, um, th those are some of the other ways in which we know some of the things we do in which we answer questions. Uh, there are also computer models. Um, I spend a lot of my time making and, and using computer models, which are basically so what is a computer model? It's, it's physics, math, computer programming, and a little bit of imagination. Um, and this is a video that shows you what it looks like when you put those things together. So this is, um, this is actually a simulation by a uh, scientist called Dr. Robin Canup. These are some simulations that she um, did in 2004. I, I don't do simulations quite like this, but, but I, you know, I use computers in, in similar ways, but this was this is a simulation of, of what happens when you have two worlds colliding. Um, and it shows how in some cases you can end up with a, with a little moon um, around uh, the, the, the larger um, neighbor in that system, which, which might sound familiar. All right, so those are some of the ways in which we know what we know. And now the next few slides, we're gonna get into some of these big open questions and concepts. The, the, the first concept uh, to, be, to be aware of, the, the, the first sort of big idea that runs through lunar science um, is that the moon is an excellent place to go to understand solar system bombardment. Um, so if you think back to, to our, our big picture view of the contours of the moon's story, you'll remember those early billions of years um, when the moon was bombarded by asteroids and comets which left these craters on the lunar surface. And in fact, most of our knowledge of when things happened in the solar system comes from studying um, the lunar surface. Um, and this, you know, th this, this, this can be, this is something that, you know, th 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 there's a big story here that I'm, that I'm gonna kind of rush through. Um, so don't worry if it doesn't make perfect sense. We can come back to it later. But, but the basic idea is, you know, well, why is it important that the moon was, was hit by comets and asteroids? There are many reasons, but one reason is that at the same time that the moon was being hit by all of these comets and asteroids, so was everything else in the solar system, including um, our own planet. And, you know, of course, interesting things were happening on our planet during those, those early years. This was when the oceans were forming, when the first um, single-celled organisms were, were getting started. So this, this is an interest, this ancient period in the solar system history is, is an interesting period when things similar to what was happening on the moon were happening everywhere else in the solar system. And so when we're trying to piece together this story, 
um, you know, one of the big questions is, well, you know, what happened and why did it happen and when did it happen? And so all of our, most of our knowledge, almost all of our knowledge of when things happen in the solar system comes from studying the moon's surface. So for instance, um, the, uh, the Apollo astronauts visited some locations on the lunar surface and they brought back rocks. Now, we think that some of those rocks are the same age as some craters on the moon. So for instance, um, and if you have those rocks in the lab, you can analyze them to figure out how old they are um, through the technique known as radiometric dating, uh, which, uh, which is not, you know, taking some uranium with you um, on a date. It's, um, it's, that's, that, that's not even funny, but it's, but it's, you know, 7.30 on the, on the East Coast. But anyway, but radiometric dating is when you look at the, the decay of uh, radioactive elements in a rock to figure out how, how old it is. Um, and we've done that for the moon. So moon rocks have been brought back. Scientists have looked at how old those rocks are. How old those rocks are tells us how old some of the craters are. And if we know how old the craters are, then we can start to figure out, well, we know the moon was being hit by some um, rather big objects at around this time. And presumably the same thing was going on at other places in the solar system. Then you sort of reason it through from there. The number of craters is also really important. So the moon has a ton of craters and some of these circles that I'm, I'm pointing at um, are, are craters. The older a surface is, the more craters it has. So another way to tell how old a surface is is by looking at how, uh, how many craters it has. So if you just, just look at this, this map, in w which has some craters outlined in circles, you'll see some areas have fewer craters than others, while some have more. That tends to be because the longer you've been sitting out in the solar system, the more times you've been, you've been hit. Um, some people also use dynamical models, which are basically computer models that look at when and how things moved around in the, in the solar system. But the moon is really key to, to understanding solar system bombardment. Um, and, and just tell you a little bit more about this map. So the circles are craters. Why are there two different colors? The, the ones in purple are some of the craters that we can see uh, with, with our own eyes. The yellow ones are kind of interesting. Yellow ones are craters that might be buried beneath the surface. Uh, if they're buried beneath the surface, how do we know they're there? Uh, in this particular case, um, there is gravity data measured by um, a spacecraft called GRAIL uh, that, that suggests that there are some buried craters and those are marked in yellow. And you might notice that the, the, the yellow craters seem to be in the, in the dark places. And then, you know, hopefully that, that, that sets off some, some questions um, in, in, in your mind. But in terms of some of the, the, the major questions that we don't yet have answers to, so one question to think about is, is what would be a good place to go to find the age um, of a specific geologic feature of interest? Now the moon is, is, is covered with interesting craters and other interesting features. Um, some of those, those are, um, you know, are, 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 are sort of features that, that um, have changed the moon in, in really important ways. Um, and now you might think that this question is, is kind of like a simple one. I mean, well, all right, let's say you want to find the age of um, Imbrium Basin, the, the, the big circle with the eye in the middle here. Well, if you want to find out how old it is, you just go there. But, it, but it's not quite that simple because imagine this, when that crater formed, the rock that was kicked up would have been carried all over the moon. And so the moon, when you hit the moon again and again with these asteroids and comets, that tends to really mix things up and move things around. Um, and so sometimes you, it, it takes a lot of careful thinking to try and figure out, well, if you go to a place on the moon and you pick up a rock and you figure out how old that rock is, well, where did that rock come from? Um, if you go to the middle of Imbrium and pick up a rock, did that rock, um, it, 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 does that rock tell you the, uh, the age of the basin that, that it's in? Or did that rock come from somewhere else? Is it telling you how old a totally different part of the moon is? So that can be a question that becomes more interesting the more you think about it. Um, the other question is what, which is related, is what is the geologic context of the lunar samples that we have? 
So for instance, the Apollo astronauts went to a few different locations on the moon. They picked up rocks, they brought them back. But we're still figuring out um, the stories that those rocks tell. So for instance, uh, the Apollo astronauts did something uh, very similar to what I just said. They picked up some rocks um, near Mare Serenitatis, brought them back. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it, it, it turned out later that some of those rocks that they brought back were probably rocks that were thrown out from a totally different part of the moon. And that complicates things when we're using those rocks to, to tell, uh, to try and put together stories. So solar system bombardment is, is one concept. Then there's the interior of, of the moon. Um, so between the time that the, the, the moon forming impact happened and the moon um, that we know today took shape, um, things were happening not just on the surface, things were also happening inside the moon. So the moon formed um, as, as a hot, uh, mostly molten world, something that Viranga knows a whole lot about and, and that his research uh, focuses a, a lot on. As the moon cooled over time, its, its interior also started to, to solidify and, and change in, in important ways. Um, some of the ways that we understand um, the, the interior of the moon are by observing things such as moonquakes. Um, uh, some of the Apollo missions set up seismometers, the, the things one uses to measure earthquakes on the lunar surface. And lo and behold, they measured moonquakes. Um, and so some of the dots here are locations where those moonquakes um, might have might have originated before they they made their way up to the surface. So the moon has moonquakes, and understanding those moonquakes tells us something about what's in the deep interior. Um, you can also measure heat flow. So the moon was born hot, and it's been cooling ever since. It's still cooling today. You can measure that. Um, when you have a planet with a molten interior, it sometimes has a magnetic field. The moon doesn't have a global magnetic field like the earth does today, um, but there are signs that at one time it might've had a magnetic field. And then there are tectonic features like this one. So if you look at these ridges in this, in this, um, in this image from, uh, from the camera on board LRO, so these are wrinkle ridges. And so those are basically wrinkles that form as the moon is sort of pushed and pulled and squished by all these forces in the inside as, as you know, rocks cool and warm and erupt. Um, all of those stresses create these, these tectonic features like these wrinkle bridges. And those also tell us something about what's going on in the deep interior to cause those pushing and pulling forces. Um, and so that leads us to, to some questions that we still don't have answers to. We're still trying to figure out what's inside the moon by studying what's on the, the outside. And there are lots of interesting avenues to, to go down there. And then there's this puzzle of the moon's magnetic field. The magnetic field of, of Earth is one of the things that, that really defines life on Earth. The moon doesn't have that. Why not? Um, did the moon have one at one point? How did it change over time? We'll come back to magnetic fields a little bit later when we talk about the surface. So there's the moon's interior, and then there's the, the moon's crust, which is just as interesting. Um, the, the moon isn't made of the same stuff all over. Um, lunar rocks come in a whole bunch of, of different types. And those rocks are important because they are, uh, on the one hand, they are the starting material for anything else. Whenever you have a crater, or a volcanic eruption, or the solar wind comes along, or a micrometeorite comes along, it's interacting uh, with, with the crust, that, that uppermost layer of the lunar surface. And so understanding what those rocks are made of is sort of the starting point for understanding everything else. And then the rocks are also different depending on where you go. And the differences in, um, in rock types across the lunar surface tells you a story. Why is it that some rocks have more iron? Why is it that some have less iron? Um, wh why are they silica rich? And so one of our main tools for, for understanding the lunar crust is spectroscopy. Um, I, I'm not going to go super deep into, into spectra um, in, in, this, in this particular talk, but, um, but, but spectra, you know, so, so, you know, so, so spectra, 
um, thinking back to the to the last physics class in which or or the future physics class in which you learned about spectra, uh, what's a spectrum? Spectrum, you're measuring the the light coming from a surface at a bunch of different wavelengths. Um, and if you translate that into a picture, you usually end up with a wiggly line. Um, that's, that's a spectrum. Um, and now different kinds of rocks have, have different types of, of, of squiggly lines uh, that tell you about the, the elements and the molecules that make up that surface. And so I, I've put some terms in here that I know you, haven't, you, you very likely haven't heard of before. And I've done that deliberately. Um, just, just so that, you know, next time you see these, you'll be seeing them for the second time rather than the first time. Um, I'm not going to explain all of these right now, um, but I'm putting them in there to, to, to give you a couple of things to, to look up and, and think of questions about. So this particular map, well, you know, there's, there's blue, there's green, there's red. Um, but what the colors indicate is the, um, the position of a spectral feature called the Christiansen feature. Um, and if that sentence doesn't quite make sense now, um, trust me, it will um, in a few months from now, you'll be talking about spectral features like you've been talking about spectral features over your life. But basically um, the colors here are telling you whether a rock is silica rich, in which case it's, it's mostly blue, or whether a rock is um, iron and magnesium rich, in which case it's, it's red and you can tell that just by looking at how the surface reflects light. Um, spectroscopy is fascinating, can also be very confusing. Um, I had to refer to my dictionary of geological terms, which I have here somewhere, uh, just, just, to, just to make the slides. But basically the, the big question when it comes to the crust is that when you look at this crust, if you, if you pull up this map at a higher resolution and zoom into it, you'll see that, well, for the most part, those volcanic plains are red, they're kind of iron rich, um, but there are some spots that stand out. There are some compositional anomalies. So right in the middle of a big iron rich patch, you might have blue spots like this, which are surprisingly silica rich. How do you end up with a very silica rich spot in the middle of an ocean of, of iron and magnesium? Um, and there are some interesting questions to explore there. What is the, the geologic context um, and origin of some of these compositional anomalies. Why do you sometimes see red surrounded by blue? Why do you sometimes see blue surrounded by red? What does that mean? What are those features? If you zoom in, what would you see? Is there a mountain? Is there a channel? Uh, what's, what's going on there? And, and that, that really is a question um, that, that to a large extent is something that, that is still being explored and studied. We don't have all the answers to that yet. All right, so we've sort of looked at the the whole of the moon in a few different ways. And now we're gonna zoom in to the, the poles. And in particular, the, these images at least are, are of the South Pole, but similar things hold for the North Pole. The poles of the moon are special. Um, like the, the poles of Earth, the poles of the moon are much colder um, than, than the rest um, of, of, of the planetary body. Um, in fact, the, the poles of the moon are some of the coldest places in the solar system. Um, there are deep, dark craters near the lunar poles that haven't seen any sunlight for billions of years. Um, and as a result, they're extremely cold. And the reason that they're so interesting is because one of the, you know, again, when you think of the Earth moon system, one of the big ways in which the Earth and the Moon are so different from each other is that one is covered with water. Um, on Earth, we have water in the atmosphere. We have ice caps at the, um, at the, the higher latitudes. Uh, we, we have the oceans. The oceans cover so much of our own planet. And then you look at the Moon. There, there are no oceans, um, but there may be some ice. The only places on the Moon that we think are cold enough for ice to exist are some of these dark craters, which are sort of marked by some of these circles um, near the poles. And just like the rest of the moon gives us some insight into the ancient history of solid rock in the solar system, um, some of the ice in craters near the poles might be very old. It might tell us something about um, how water was delivered to our own planet. Um, the, you know, so much is going on on Earth in terms of, you know, the, the oceans are so alive and, you know, they're, they're, 
changing all the time um, that it's, it's hard to figure out the history of oceans on Earth by looking at the oceans on Earth. Um, but if we go to the poles of the moon, one of the ideas out there um, is that some of the oldest water to come into the inner solar system might be hiding within the shadows of some of these craters. Um, and so there have been a lot of studies of, um, of the poles of the moon. So this, um, this, this sort of medicine wheel that you see here um, is, is a collage of the, um, the lunar south pole seen in sunlight, um, seen in radar, seen in ultraviolet starlight, um, seen if we measured infrared radiation. So this, this map is looking at how hot or cold the surface is. We can also measure elevation. Uh, we can measure neutrons. I'm not even going to get into what I mean when I say we can measure neutrons, but neutrons can tell you some interesting things. But we've looked at the poles of the moon in many different ways to try and understand if there's water there, how much water there is, and what it tells us um, about the history of water in the solar system. Um, this, is, this is another view of, of the same area. And there, there are a few different colors on here. So um, outlined in, in green are some of those cold, dark shadows that I mentioned. Um, the little yellow dots are places where we think there's a little bit of water at the surface. Um, and if you look at all of these craters, you'll see that some of them do have little yellow dots in them. Those are outlined in blue. Some don't. So why is it that some craters have water in them and some don't? Um, you know, some of them are, 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 are cold, but they don't have any water ice. So, and, and why is it that some do and some don't? So there's so lots of mysteries there. Um, one of the things we, we don't know, in spite of all of these years of, um, of exploration, because it's such uh, because it's such a puzzle, is where, so we know there's a little bit, we know there's some water um, at the poles of the moon, but we don't know what the origin of that water is. We don't understand how it's distributed um, and how old it is. Um, and I say water, but the same thing also applies to other volatiles like carbon dioxide and um, ammonia and other things. So volatiles are things that usually exist as, as gases or ices. Uh, water is an important one, but there are some other interesting ones as well. So keep that in the, in the back of your mind. And then, of course, the other um, interesting, well, not of course, but, but the other interesting question out there is, well, let's say one of those long ago comets brought some water to the moon and, and it's stuck around in, uh, in one of these cold, dark craters. What happened to it over the next few billions of years? Because if this is ancient water, then what's happened to it? What sort of physical and chemical processes have changed that water over time um, is, is another open question. And then, and we're, we're switching through, the, 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 there's a lot of stuff in here. So, um, so some of it might be going by um, a, a, a little bit fast, but then there's, there's lunar volcanism. Um, so we, we mentioned near the beginning um, that volcanism is, is one of the major geological processes that are shaped the surface of, of the moon. Lunar volcanism is interesting. Uh, when we talk about volcanic features on the moon, we're not just talking about the, those dark planes that, that cover um, so much of the moon when we look at it from, from Earth. Those are an important part of the volcanism story, but there are all kinds of other strange and, and wonderful features. Um, there are pits. Um, which are literally pits in the, uh, in the lava flows. Um, if you look at them closely, you can see some, some interesting layers. Uh, what's going on there? Are these successive layers of, 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 of lava flows? How, how old are they? Um, what can we tell by looking at pits? There are also domes. I don't have a picture of a dome in here. Uh, there are also imps, which are irregular mare patches. So dark volcanic plains on the moon are called mare. Um, Irregular mare patches or imps are irregular patches in the middle of the mare, like this one here, which is a truly weird looking feature. You know, you have this, this sort of bubbly looking patch sitting in the middle of an otherwise unremarkable um, volcanic plain. How those formed is almost a complete mystery. Uh, we think they're very young because they don't have a lot of craters in them. Um, but beyond that, 
what these things are um, is, is largely unknown. There are also pyroclastic deposits, which are basically some volcanic eruptions happen so fast that you have all of this hot rock that's spewed into space. It cools, it cools so fast that it becomes glass. And then you have this rain of glass beads that falls down um, uh, over great distances from volcanic vents, such as this one. So in the middle here is a volcanic vent. Um, and the, the colors show um, these, these pyroclastic deposits, which are basically glass deposits all around this vent. And in fact, the colors here seem to indicate that some of those beads have water within them. Um, and it, so that's telling us something about the composition of, of the lavas that erupted from that vent. So some open questions are, uh, where are the oldest and youngest volcanic features um, on the moon? And, you know, I said lunar volc volcanism lasted from about 3.8 billion years ago to about 1 billion years ago, uh, but the details of that are, are still a little fuzzy. Um, so when exactly did lunar volcanism begin and end? And where are the youngest and oldest features on the lunar surface? So for instance, is, is something like Ina, this imp here, um, is this one of the... Uh, one of the uh, the youngest volcanic eruptions on the moon is this was this the last eruption before volcanism ended forever um, we don't quite know and then how did the composition and eruption style of lavas change over time when did they explode outward when did they sort of flow gently um, and and how did that change over time the other big geological process on the moon is impact cratering so we've talked a lot about craters because it's, it's hard to talk about the moon without talking about craters. Uh, two things to know about craters. One, they vary dramatically in size. Um, they're craters the size of grains of sand. They're craters that cover almost the entire hemisphere of the moon. Uh, second thing to know about craters, new craters form even today. These are two images taken over the last 10 years. Uh, this is a before image, this is the after image, and you can see there's a new crater that's formed. And in fact, uh, the LRO spacecraft has detected many of these new craters. Um, LRO has also detected some other in interesting features. So one of the things that LRO has noticed is that, is that there are some young craters on the moon um, which, which have uh, these, you know, th these aren't really blue regions, but on this map, what the color blue means is that you have a tiny little crater in the middle and then for a huge distance around it, you have some material that's colder than the rest of the surface during night. And we don't know why that is. We don't know what happens when a crater forms that causes the material for kilometers, tens of kilometers around it to be colder at night than the rest of the surface. Um, does, does the impact fluff up the surface in some kind of way? What's, what's going on there? Um, that's, that's another one of the big mysteries that's emerged over the last 10 years. Um, and then this is, a, this is a video showing you the effect of, of one of the, the larger lunar craters. So a colleague of mine, Heather Meyer, um, she spent many, many years mapping the locations of a certain kind of region on the moon called the light plane. And so Heather looked for these light planes um, all over the moon and she created a map. And when she created a map, she saw that there was something quite interesting about the distribution of those planes. And so if, if I, I go back here and you can play the video to your heart's content because I'll send you the slides. But one thing that she noticed was that all of these light planes seem to almost radiate outwards from this big crater here called Orientali. And so what that seemed to suggest was that there was this one impact, one huge impact that somehow affected almost the entire um, lunar surface. And so the big open question is, well, we see craters of all kinds of different sizes and we're still piecing together the story of how those different craters affected the lunar surface. So craters and volcanism, you know, that we see craters forming even today, but that the big basins formed a pretty long time ago. Volcanism ended a, a pretty long time ago, but um, there are still other things, other physics and chemistry happening on the lunar surface today. Um, and so there's this, this theme um, 
of regolith processes and space weathering, um, about which we have a lot of questions. So two of the most important ongoing processes on the moon are solar wind bombardment, hydrogen from the sun, hydrogen and other charged particles from the sun that interact with the lunar surface, and micrometeoroids, those tiny dust grains and other things that break off comets and um, whiz around the solar system. They cause meteor showers on Earth when they hit the moon. Um, they, they can uh, churn up the surface uh, at the microscopic scale, uh, leading to, to some interesting features seen in, uh, in, in, in lunar rocks. Um, and we refer to that process. We refer to the exposure of a surface to space, to, to solar wind and to micrometeoroids as space weathering. Um, so space weathering is what micrometeoroids and solar wind do to a surface um, that's, that's sitting out in space. Um, that's a process we're trying to understand today. And we're also trying to understand which is more important. Are the micrometeoroids more important or is the solar wind more important in terms of changing the composition and the structure of the lunar surface? Um, there are also some interesting things that happen. One of the, the most interesting um, features on the lunar surface are the lunar swirls, which, which really look like, like swirls in, in cream or in a coffee mug. Um, so we talked about charged particles coming from the sun. We mentioned the moon's magnetic field a little while ago. So the moon today doesn't have a, a big global magnetic field like the Earth. But there are some parts of the lunar surface where there is a magnetic field. Um, and a lot of those locations also happen to have these swirls. Um, and so, so what's, what's going on here is that we think that when you have a magnetic field in a small patch of the lunar surface, that magnetic field tends to protect some of the surface from um, this, this incoming rain of charged particles. And so what you see here um, is, is an animation of, of some simulations that, that um, a colleague of mine did, which show, uh, so, so the basic idea here is that when you have a magnetic field on the moon, it can protect the surface from um, incoming hydrogen, which tends to darken the surface. So the region that's protected from, um, from that incoming solar wind tends to be lighter than the surrounding uh, region. And that leads to some really beautiful features. Um, you can actually see a swirl from, from Earth through a, through a good telescope. Um, but, but, you know, but th that's, that's just, just you know, I, I threw this in just to give you an idea of, well, okay, there's hydrogen coming from the sun, it hits the lunar surface. But that can really change the surface in ways that you can see and in ways that are sometimes quite beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm skipping through a little bit fast because I know we're coming to the, the end of the hour. So this is the last concept. And then I have one slide of, of, of closing uh, slides. So this is a, a few different concepts thrown into one. Uh, there's dust, plasma, and the lunar volatile cycle. Um, so, so we talked about charged particles around the sun. Charged particles are, are basically the, the plasma. Uh, there's dust around the moon. Um, there are also volatiles, not just at the poles, um, but also in the very thin um, atmosphere of the moon and spread across the surface in, in smaller quantities. So even though water ice can only exist um, in, in cold, dark shadows near the poles, there might be water molecules and, and other gas molecules, you know, helium and maybe some methane, carbon dioxide, um, floating around in small quantities at, at other locations. Um, so these are two results um, from two missions that some of you uh, might, might end up working with. Um, this is a map of, of how much dust there is around the moon, which is measured by um, a spacecraft called LADI. This is a map of, um, of not H2O, which is water, but of OH, which is hydroxyl. Um, across the lunar surface that was, that was measured by um, a, a scientific instrument called M-cubed on a spacecraft called Chandrayaan-1 that was built by the, uh, the Space Agency of India, ISRO. Um, and and that's, that's led to some, some interesting puzzles. 
um, that some of you might choose to dive into later. But some of the big outstanding questions there are, uh, when it comes to the volatiles, just like the ones at the poles, where did the volatiles um, at, uh, at out, where did the volatiles beyond the poles come from? And, and um, how do they move across the lunar surface? And then what is the dust and plasma environment like? Um, something that's really important to know if you're sending spacecraft or astronauts to the moon, because the, the dust and charged particles are, are going to affect um, how, um, uh, you know, uh, what kind of things they need to be protected from and, and what kind of science they're going to do. So, um, so what is the dust and plasma environment like and how does it change with location and time? So you, you, know, um, you, um, you might have read about how the, the sun goes through a solar cycle. Um, the, the intensity of the sun changes over time. Uh, how does that affect, um, for instance, the, the plasma environment around the moon, which, is, um, uh, which consists you know, in, a, in a large part of particles from the sun? How does, how does all of that change with time? Uh, when you have a meteor shower, does that throw up more dust? Um, and, and the answer to that particular question is, um, is yes, but we're still figuring out some of the, some of the details. So dust, plasma, and volatiles are, are some of the, the active processes on the moon today. And then last slide, um, so closing thoughts. So there's a lot of information in here. This was the first time I did this particular presentation. So I wasn't sure how long it would take. It took a little longer than I, than I thought I would. Um, and I know I didn't explain in everything um, in, in, in as much detail um, as it would take to, to, you know, to, to really make sure everyone understands it. So, um, so, so that's okay. So, so if everything didn't make sense, um, yeah, that, that's not you. It's because there was a lot of information in this. Um, and I'll make sure you have the slides and of course you'll have the recording. And then, you know, you'll have your advisors to ask all kinds of questions to you can be, hey, Parvati mentioned this, but it didn't make any sense. What does that mean? Um, so some thoughts I want to leave you with. The, the first is everything you need to do good science can be learned, um, everything. You might do things, you know, so for instance, um, one of the things I'm sure you'll run into is your advisors will send you a paper, you will read the paper, and it won't make any sense. Um, that's because understanding um, a scientific paper is a learned skill. Um, it's different from, from just regular reading that we do in everyday life. No one reads a scientific paper um, for the first time and understands everything. It's a learned skill. Um, learning to read scientific literature is a learned skill. Um, learning to do data analysis, it's a learned skill. Uh, scientific presentations, they're something you learn over time. They're not just something you go in knowing how to do. And everything you need to do good science can be learned. Uh, and your advisors are, are there to, to help you do that. Um, there really is no such thing um, as, as a bad question. You can try and come up with examples of bad questions. I will tell you why they're not a bad question. Um, Ask us questions. If we don't know the answer to something, we'll try and find out or we'll try and find someone else who does. We do this all the time. Uh, even if you think we might not know, ask us anyway. Uh, we might know. If we don't, we'll find you someone else who does. Um, the other thing is, you know, when, when you're reading papers and, and trying to find science questions, it might seem like some of the stuff requires really specialized knowledge or tools. Um, and, you know, you might think, oh, well, there's no way we can do that. Um, but but ask anyway, because it might be something that is doable. Because you know, ultimately, planetary science um, is, is, is mostly publicly supported. And so what that means in practical terms is that most planetary scientists are doing the work they do to make that knowledge available to, to everyone. Um, and so, you know, so so there's so most scientific data and a lot of the tools and codes we use to do science are available, and there are people who can help you. Um, use those and get connected with those. Um, so, so, you know, so, uh, so for instance, you know, even, um, so, so, so yeah, so, so don't be scared of the problems that might seem like they're too specialized to approach. They might be, but, but ask us anyway, because they, they might be doable. Um, you might end up with more questions than answers at the end of XMAS. That's, that's okay. That's, that's often a good thing. Uh, planetary science is super cool, but you know we don't all sit around being Carl Sagan um, every day. It's it's a job. Um, sometimes you know everyone has off days. Sometimes it can be really tedious or really frustrating. We're not you know 100 percent 
excited and, and in awe at the solar system all of the time. Um, so, so, you know, so it's, it's, it's extremely cool work, but it can also be tedious and frustrating at times. Uh, that, that's okay. Um, and then, you know, I think as you, as you do your science, um, it's, it's not only a way to learn about the moon and the solar system, it's also a way to learn about what, uh, about yourself. Um, you know, it's, it's a chance to think about what kind of things you value, um, how you work, and it's also a chance to learn about other people. So, you know, I found that, that over the years, um, I, I, I found, you know, I, I've grown to find the, the people I work with and the, the ways they think and the ways they do their science uh, almost as, as interesting uh, as the solar system, which is, which is quite saying something. So, so it's a way to, uh, to not only learn about stuff, you know, out there, it's, it's also a way to sort of learn how um, you think and, and um, how other people think, because there's, there's a lot of deep thinking involved in scientific research. So those are some closing thoughts. Um, I know I went a, a, a little over time, um, and I, I know being teachers, all of you um, have very important work to do and have probably had very long days already. Um, I'm hoping we have time for a little uh, for a few questions, but 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 if not, um, you know, feel free to, to email me or your advisors, um, uh, you know, or or Andy who can pass along any questions um, anytime. My email address is I, I'll put it in the chat. It's my first name dot last name um, at gmail.com is is usually the the one I check more often. Um, but yeah, that's that's it for me. So I'm gonna stop talking now. Um, and, and thank you all for, for tuning in because I know it's, it's, um, and I'm sure it's been a, a long day for everyone. So, uh, so thank you for, for letting me talk to you. And if we have any time for questions, I'm happy to, to answer any of them. Great. Thank you, Parvati. That was, that was great.